It's time to look in the mirror, America. Do you like what you see? I keep referring to Obama as the magic Negro. Do you like what you see now? Well, suck on this. It's just a mirror, America. Shared sacrifice by everybody. What could it do to you except reflect your image? I did nothing wrong at the Minneapolis airport. The Majority Report. Far more credible to me than PBS. And Frontline. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. Uh, ever get the feeling you've been cheated? It is Wednesday, October 4th, 2017. My Two thousand seventeen. It is. Let's try this again. Let. Yeah. Let's just start it over. Do it again. The majority report with Sam Cedar. It's time to look in the mirror, America. Do you like what you see? I keep referring to Obama as the magic Negro. Do you like what you see now? Well, suck on this. It's just a mirror, America. Shared sacrifice by everybody. What could it do to you except reflect your image? I did nothing wrong at the Minneapolis airport. The Majority Report. Far more credible to me than PBS. And Frontline. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. Uh it is Wednesday, October 4th, 2017. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the four-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today... Justice editor for Think Progress, author of Injustices, the Supreme Court's History of Comforting the Comfortable and Afflicting the Afflicted, Ian Milheiser, will be here to give us a preview of this Supreme Court's term, including a rundown of the arguments in a really important gerrymandering case that had oral arguments yesterday in front of the court. Also on the program today, Trump goes full sociopath on Puerto Rico tour. Manafort's son-in-law turns. Ivanka and Junior seem to have bought their way out of a fraud indictment. That's my kids. The knives are out for Tillerson. Former Obama administration health care officials will fight Trump on Affordable Care Act signups. And a new study without federal and state subsidies, 45% of oil production in this country at this price would be unprofitable. Meanwhile, an anti choice congressman begs his mistress to get an abortion. Please. Paul Ryan, Mitch McConnell. In gun rights expansion triage. And lastly, our Secretary of Education spends $6.5 million. Million dollars. On defense. On million. Did I say billion? Six point, six point five million dollars a year on security. All that and more on today's program. Folks, sorry, uh, we had a little false start there because uh, there's something wrong with my microphone. Apparently, it's a little on? bit loose. Michael broke it last night. Oh, of course. And uh, I should also tell you that I already have a correction to make about today's program. Earlier in this program today, I said that we are the four time award winning majority report, and I want to apologize. What I should have said is that we are the 
five-time award-winning Majority Report. That's right, folks. You folks and the voters. I'm not even quite clear on how, uh, how it works. I, they have a different system over at podcastawards.com. We won our fifth Best News and Politics Award from podcastawards.com. And that makes a... Uh, that makes it, we are five for five out of the years that we were eligible for that award. Five for five. I think we're done now. I don't think we can win it anymore. I think we broke it. It's called a perfect record, Puerto Rico. Yeah, it's too bad Puerto, Puerto Rico, Rico couldn't get it together and do something like that. I wish they could win a podcast award. We're, we're the San Antonio <clears throat> Spurs of podcasts. Wow. Well, I mean, I think the Celts won uh, a lot of uh, But the Spurs won five. Whatever. In a certain Listen, sense. folks, seriously, uh, thank you. Thank you for the support. And um, and it is um, it's nice. I mean, it's it's nice to get acknowledged for your work in that way. And so we all here appreciate it. Um, everybody's going to get a chance to take the trophy home for a night. <laughs> <laughs> take it out to a bar or whatever. Yeah, Matt. Matt's so like, wearing. Yeah, it's nothing. That's just uh, it's a little thing called trophy. Yeah, sorry. Uh, oh, excuse me. Let me uh, let me just move that. Michael will drink uh, his Chardonnay out of it. Chablis. Flip it over. Drink a Chablis. Chablis. You know. Uh, <clears throat> You'll lord it over your children. I <laughs> in will. In an attempt to get some authority. I definitely will. Excuse me, young lady. Do you realize I've won five time award winning show? Now you get to bed. I'm sorry, folks. This week has just been uh, insane, and I'm I'm feeling a little punch drunk. I think it's only, Wednesday. It's only Wednesday. You know, um, when Michael goes out with that uh, trophy and his uh, Porsche Chablis in it uh, to the, his local wine bar, he'll be looking for something. For some, like Michael, that night he'll be looking for a little attention. For others, it's <laughs> it's for purpose. That was the transition. Unforgettable experiences. But for most of us, let's face it, it's our keys. <laughs> now, look, people ask me, why do I wear the same pair of pants every day? Because you have weird folks. No, no, it, you're absolutely wrong. You're wrong. <laughs> you're wrong. You're wrong. I switched over. It's August 2nd the other day. I switched over from my shorts into my pants. And the reason why I do it is because I'm always like I have too many things going on and I can't think about like where's my wallet, where's my keys. If my keys don't go in my pants, I get everything gets messed up. But I have a backup plan. Tracker Pixel, you will never worry about losing your things again. 8 years ago, Tracker it's track and then an R. Changed everything when they released their first tracking device. Now they've done it again with the all-new Tracker Pixel. It's the lightest Bluetooth tracking device on the market. You place Tracker Pixel on whatever you tend to lose. Keys, wallets. I don't know. You could put it on your animals, I guess. Um, then, when you misplace an item that has a Tracker Pixel attached... You use your smartphone, and a 90-decibel alert will help you find it in seconds. It has powerful LED lights, so you can see things in the dark. And it can help you find your phone even when it's silent. And this is the amazing part. Okay, it's Bluetooth, right? But because every tracker is user, is part of the largest crowd locate network in the world, you can locate items from miles away. So a crowdsource it through Bluetooth. And thanks to Tracker's 30-day money-back guarantee, you truly have nothing to lose. You can go to, the, go to thetracker.com. That's the word the, track, and then the letter R, dot com. Enter promo code MAJORITY. Get 20% off any order. That's tracker.com, promo code MAJORITY for 20% off. Ladies and gentlemen, this is going to allow me to change my pants. TheTracker.com, promo code MAJORITY. Now, in addition to uh, maintaining uh, the same clothes all the time so that I don't... Uh, the other thing is helping me right now get through this because the amount of news 
folks, is just insane. It's just insane. And so there are long-form magazine articles that I want to read. I don't have time to read them. I don't know how I'm going to get them. And the thing that's basically helping me right now is my Texture app. I've talked about it a lot. You know about it. Uh, in two weeks, I'd make my trip to Vegas. Honestly, the thing I'm thinking about most right now, well, in addition to like how I'm going to win the craft table, is that plane ride where I'm going to sit down with my uh, iPad and go through all of these articles that I've set aside in Texture. It has over 200 plus magazines available. Puts an endless supply of in-depth interviews, articles in the palm of your hand. It gives you daily recommendations, exclusive interactive features. And it's fully searchable. So you can mark what you like. This is the part that I like. You check out old issues. You view bonus video content. You create your own magazine from 200 plus magazines for the cost of basically one subscription. They got National Geographic, they got Fast Company, they got Rolling Stone, they got Wired, they got Family Handyman, they got New Yorker, New York. It's normally $9.99 a month, but if you sign up right now at texture.com slash majority, you get a 14-day free trial. 14 days. Try Texture for free when you go to texture.com slash majority. Texture.com slash majority. Uh, check it out, folks. Honestly, it's um, like I, I, you know, I don't know. I guess it's maybe a testament to uh, uh, my life, but I really do. Like this is my, like, my big fantasy. Like I'm going to have three hours to, to read anything I want. Um, I kind of get it now. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, you just wait, buddy. And here is, uh, and this is also exciting. We're we're very close. We've been doing a um, a, a several week long search, essentially, for new hires, not necessarily to replace old Kelly, even though she's now moved into the slot of old Kelly. But because um, she's still sort of like she's still present Kelly, just not local present Kelly. I don't know how. To, Virtual Kelly. She's virtual Kelly. Uh, and we did our job search on ZipRecruiter. And I'll tell you something. It was the smartest thing I feel like I've done in ages. Perhaps ever. Uh, ask me this question. Do you know where to post uh, your job to find the best candidates? Do you know where to post No, your I didn't. I had no idea. So I just did it on ZipRecruiter. And it went to 100 plus job sites with one click. I went on uh, Glass Ceiling to look up something. That's where you find out like what pay scales yeah. are for different professions. Mm -hmm. I found our, I was looking in the radio thing and I found our ad. Oh, I thought you were gonna say Binder rated you, but never mind. No, Binder <laughs> did not rate me. He did a very bad job. ZipRecruiter doesn't depend on candidates finding you. It finds them. 80% of employers who post a job on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site within one day. And there's no juggling emails, no calls to the office, screen, rate, manage all the candidates in on the ZipRecruiter dashboard. It's been really a great experience. Find out why ZipRecruiter has been used by businesses of all sizes. This tiny, tiny one that we have here and the massive one will become. Right now, my listeners can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free. That's right, for free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash majority. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash majority. One more time, try for free. Go to ZipRecruiter.com slash majority. You know my uh, watchwords. The best time to look for candidates is when you're not hiring. All right. Let's do this uh, um, uh, uh, fairly quickly. This, Donald Trump was in Puerto Rico. Uh, yesterday, he was there for about four hours. They had to extend the trip because um, there is a strong sense that he is completely out of touch, and they wanted to make it look like he actually cared about people. I wonder down where there. that came from. We have a lot of audio and video from his trip there that I think, if you were, um, if you were like a daughter or a son of Donald Trump's, and you were trying to get him committed, this is footage that you would submit to the court. And say this guy is just not he, he doesn't have a sense of where he is or what's Your going honor, on. Look. Yes. <laughs> this is what we'd like to submit as evidence. Uh -huh. 
But here is another moment where Donald Trump wings it and actually says something that would genuinely be good for Puerto Rico. And remember, well, listen to what he says in an interview with Geraldo Rivera, Puerto Rico, which has been under the thumb of vulture capitalists and hedge funders for years now. Here's Donald Trump. We're going to work something out. We have to look at their whole debt structure. You know, they owe a lot of money to your friends on Wall Street, and we're going to have to wipe that out. That's going to have to be, uh, you know, you can say goodbye to that. I don't know if it's Goldman Sachs, but whoever it is, you can wave goodbye to that. We have to do something about because the debt was massive on the island. And uh, Okay, so there you have it. Yeah. He's going to wipe out the debt. Now, there's a guy who knows how to wipe out debt. If anybody does, Donald Trump. Just don't pay. This guys. is what people have been asking for. This would be huge. It would be monumental. And it's undoubtedly not going to happen. Here's Muck Mulvaney uh, just hours later on with Chris Cuomo. The president sure. seemed to suggest that he is open to wiping out the Puerto Rican Pause debt. It. I got to just correct Chris Cuomo there. He didn't seem to suggest anything. He said, we're going to wipe it out. But okay. Freaking debt. Is that to be taken seriously on its face? Uh, I wouldn't take it word for word with that. I talked to the president about this at some length yesterday as we flew home on, the, uh, on Air Force One. And what we're focusing on right now is what you and I just talked about, which is the primary focus of the federal effort is to make sure the island is safe, and that we're rebuilding the island. Dealing with the challenges that Puerto Rico had, the island is at least $72 billion in debt, 120 if you go by other counts, before the storm. We are going to focus our attention right now on rebuilding the island, repairing the island, making sure everybody is safe, and that we get through this difficult time. Yeah, in other words, oh, <laughs> he's crazy, and we're not going to do that. So... Sometimes inadvertently he advocates for things that might genuinely benefit people. So then I got to pull him aside in the plane right. and explain. Exactly. There's no way that we're going to try to alleviate the suffering of the PRs. Yes. We're kind of on the opposite agenda. We're trying to create more suffering in the uh, world. Oh, okay. All right. Well, uh, Bannon texted me, told me to say that. And then I said it. And that's all we really need anyways. We just need it to be said. Just say and then, things. Then, then, then we'll let, okay, nobody's going to pay attention to Puerto Rico anymore anyways. Okay, that's, that's great. All right. I was so it. confused why Steve would want to do that. It took me a long time for him to explain that they weren't Mexicans. Right. All right, we got to take a quick break. When we come back, Ian Melheiser. back sam cedar on the majority report on the phone it is a pleasure to welcome back to the program ian milheiser he is the justice editor for think progress and author of injustices the supreme court's history of comforting the comfortable and afflicting the afflicted uh, welcome back to the program ian it's good to be here thanks so much uh so all right let's start with uh, Guy, uh gill v whitford this is the um there are uh, multiple sort of, I guess, like, in incredibly important cases in, in terms of what it will do to our politics and to our society that will come up in this term. And this is the um, this is obviously the first term of the Supreme Court with uh, Neil Gorsuch uh, sitting on the court. 
sitting in a seat that was uh, really meant to be uh, Merrick Garland's or someone else's. Um, And uh, this is the the balance of the court has switched back to the conservatives. And and this is going to be relevant when we look at cases that are more or less being revisited, not the exact same cases, but the simple the same uh, uh, legal questions. But let's start with Gil v. Whitford. What is this case about? Sure. I mean, Gill, it, it, it's not an exaggeration. Say not only is this the most important case of the term, but it's probably the most important case we've seen in several years. Um, Gill is an attack on partisan gerrymandering. Um, and it was very clear several justices made comments. Paul Smith, the voting rights attorney, arguing the case against gerrymandering, made several comments about how Gerrymandering is just getting more and more sophisticated. We're getting better data analysis tools, better computers, and we are going. We are entering a downward spiral where the party that controls the the legislature when the maps are drawn can lock themselves into power so that they'll control the legislature legislature again when the next round of maps are drawn, and you no longer have competitive elections. In Um, fact, so that's the Smith um, uh, cited. Uh, And there's some data, I mean, specific data that I guess like um, in there was uh, in Wisconsin, they redrew the maps in 2011. And the next year, the Republicans won won 148.6 of the vote in that state in Wisconsin. But they won 60 out of 99 assembly seats. Right. So they they actually they, 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 outperf- right, they actually lost the popular election that year and still won the legislature because of the gerrymander. Not even just won the legislature and like what you would call a landslide. Right. I mean. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it was yeah over 60 percent of the seats when they lost the election. This was an extraordinary gerrymander. Um, and so the question here is whether this gerrymander violates the Constitution. And, and let's just um, and, just explain for a moment, just to back up for people who don't understand how that works. Like, I mean, there, you know, I think like mm-hmm. for for the uninitiated, and and we've talked about this on this program multiple times. Uh, we had an interview with um, uh, with the author of uh, Rat Eft, uh, which mm-hmm. b- talked about this. But but just broadly speaking, explain how it is that you can lose the popular vote in a state, but still right. win the uh, election uh, uh, that many seats. Right. So th- there's basically two ways that you people draw gerrymandered maps. In Wisconsin, they did both. One is called packing. So packing is, you know, let's say that you have a district that's already a solid Democratic district. Maybe 60 percent of the voters in that district consistently vote for the Democrats. Packing is when you just pack in a bunch more Democrats and turn a 60 percent Democrat district into, say, a 90 or 95 percent district. And what you do by packing is you cause all those Democrats you pack into it to waste their vote because, you know, they're going to be voting for someone who's already going to win anyway. The other thing that you do is called cracking. So cracking is, let's say you have a district that's narrowly Democrat, that's maybe 55 percent Democrat, where you'd expect the Democratic candidate to win most of the time. Cracking means you crack off a little sliver of those Democrats, put them somewhere else in a Republican district, and then fill in the voters you cracked off with more Republicans. So a 55 percent Democrat district becomes maybe a 45 percent Democrat district. And then... You know, and then the Democratic right. candidate is go is going to lose. Um, and so that's what they did over and over and over again when they drew this map. Is they looked for opportunities to to turn Democratic districts into Republican districts through cracking, and where they there were too many Democrats living in one place to prevent a Democrat from getting elected, they just packed a whole bunch more Democrats in. So a whole lot of votes would be would be a whole lot of Democratic votes would be wasted. And that's what they accomplished here. That's how they got this map where Republicans could lose the popular election, still get more than 60 percent of the seats. OK, so um, uh, that's the um, that that's the the, the, the situation. And, and, and so outline what is the argument made by Paul Smith, who was arguing for right. the plaintiff, saying that this was essentially a- anti-democratic? What, what's the argument? Well, so here's the interesting thing, 
there really isn't any d- dispute this, that this violates the Constitution. I mean, some people have argued that it violates the First Amendment because you're discriminating against certain voters based on their viewpoint. Some people argue that it violates the Equal Protection Clause because you're treating voters who belong to one party better than voters who belong to the other party. But there, there really isn't that much disagreement over whether or not this violates the Constitution. And I don't think anyone really made an argument that it's OK to do this. What the court has said is, look, figuring out which maps are gerrymanders is really hard. Like, I mean, this is an easy case because the map is so egregious. But like, you know, if a map, if a state has 46 percent Democrats and they get 44 percent of the vote, is that a gerrymander? You know, what if they get 40 percent or 40 percent of the seats? What if they get 55 percent of the seats? Like, it's sometimes hard to draw these lines. Um, what's interesting about this case is that the plaintiffs have come up with a number of mathematical formulas that can be used, and you run the map through these formulas, and they will tell you if this map is likely, it's very likely to be a gerrymander or not. So they've answered this question, how do we sort out the bad maps? You know, they, they, they found analytic, rigorous, objective ways to do that. And the question is whether there are five justices on the court who will say, okay, you've answered the how do we, how do we measure gerrymanders problem. Now we're going to go ahead and force what pretty much everyone, except for, I guess, Gorsuch. Gorsuch was the one guy yesterday who said that he thought that gerrymanders maybe don't violate the Constitution. I, I want to get into that Gorsuch, in a minute. Right. Yeah, but, 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 but besides Gorsuch, literally everyone seems to think this is unconstitutional. The question is whether or not um, whether or not there's a way that courts can go through and, and figure out which maps are, in fact, gerrymandered. Right. So uh, this is sort of like the um, uh, the problem was you don't know it necessarily when you see it, um, to, uh, to, 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 to put it in the context of uh, pornography, I guess. Um, and, right. And, and so, OK, so there's there's a couple of different ways of measuring this. But but w- Kennedy was one of the justices who specifically cited the lack of of a mechanism to determine this. Right. I mean, that was always right. supposedly his big stumbling block. Right. Yes. Yeah. So in 2004, um, before most conservative justices or, or well, four of the conservative justices in 2004, said that we're just not going to get involved in the gerrymandering business at all. It's too hard. Um, And Kennedy wrote a separate opinion where he said, you know, this is pretty hard and no one showed me a way to do it now. But if somewhere along the way people figured out a way to measure what it is and is not a gerrymander, I'd be willing to consider striking down gerrymandered maps. And that's in Vith um, v. Jubiler, right? Or uh, Jubiler? Yeah, Vith v. Jubiler. Okay. It's, it's, it's two completely un- unpronounceable names. Um, Vith, I believe, is, is the name of the first party. Um, so, so Justice Kennedy says this in 2004, and then that sort of spawned this entire new field of political science, where for the last 13 years, there have been a lot of really smart people trying to meet Kennedy's challenge and trying to say, like, okay, like, Kennedy has said if we can show him an objective, solid, you know, way that courts can use to sort gerrymanders from, the, from, uh, from maps that aren't gerrymanders, um, he will start striking them down. And people actually came up with three different methods um, that can be used, all of which came up in this case. The, the, this Wisconsin map um, any one of the three methods determines that it's an egregious gerrymander. Um, and so this is the question. Is after 13 years of work on this puzzle that Justice Kennedy gave the nation, after 13 years of people trying to say, okay, what is a way we can do to sort through the maps? Is Kennedy going to say, okay, like you have, you have done what I have asked you to do, and now I'm going to give you what I have said I would give you, or is he still going to hem and haw? Well, I mean, that's that's I mean, that's what's sort of amazing about this. Right. Is because um, the implications of him saying, like, there has to be a way to do this. And it's you know, he wasn't anticipating that someone would come down from the sky and divine it, that it would, I guess, come from social sciences. Um, And uh, this puts a lot of pressure on him, it seems to me, to sort of uh, accept it, I guess, 
if they can understand the math. And that became that became an issue, right? There were my understanding is there were three different sort of uh, stabs at this, um, right? It, that uh, tell us what they were and how the justices reacted to it. Sure. So I, I mean. You know, there, there, there's some complexity to all of the methods. One of the methods counts the number of wasted votes. So, like, counts the number of votes through cracking and packing that are either cast for a Democrat who would have won anyway or for a Democrat who lost, and then does the same for a Republican candidate. And if there's an imbalance um, in, you know, in those wasted votes, then that tends to show a gerrymander. If there's a large imbalance that shows it could be an egregious gerrymander. Um, you know, another method looks at if you had a 50-50 state. So if you assume that um, in this election, you know, 50% of people vote for Democrats, 50% of people vote for Republicans, it tries to extrapolate what sort of legislature you'd wind up with. Um, there's a third method as well. So, like, they, they've come up with these different mathematical models um roberts chief justice roberts was very hostile to the notion that judges should have to do math he had this whole rant about how well we're going to look partisan if we rule in favor of democrats and then the only explanation we're able to give is a mathematical formula that people may not understand which is an interesting thing for the guy who who wrote the who wrote the opinion striking down the Voting Rights Act to suddenly say that, oh, we might look partisan if we start striking down election laws. Um, but anyway, um, I think that there was a sense amongst the conservatives, and I don't know if it was disingenuous or not, that math is not a thing that judges should be doing. Judges just shouldn't be in the business of like using formulas derived by social scientists. Um, you, you know, Gorsuch had this rant about like that's not something that's in the Constitution, and, and well, I think Kennedy. Oh, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead, please finish, and then we'll get to that. I think Kennedy at least seemed open to doing it. I, I mean, the the the, intre- the most interesting thing about the argument is that Kennedy asked no questions at all of Paul Smith, the uh, the voting rights attorney, and at one point he got really angry at one of the lawyers who was defending the maps because she wasn't answering one of his questions. So normally with Kennedy, when like he gets a little testy towards an attorney, that's a, that's often a sign that that lawyer is about to lose. Right. Okay, good. Um, yeah. And all right. So uh, I want to get to the Gorsuch thing in a second, but what, mm-hmm. uh, what so what, how, the, the question then becomes like how broad this ruling will be. Right. I mean, is it like, right. OK, Wisconsin was so egregious that I mean, this, yeah. uh, so egregious that, OK, yeah, all three of these methodologies were probably right because it was like, you know, hitting a barn from five feet away. What happens right. when that barn is 75 yards away, 150 right. yards away, whatever it is? Uh, so. Right. That becomes the big question, right? Because, um, or, 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 or does it? I mean, it, or does this question have to be answered each time? Right. So, I mean, I think what the justice or justices are looking for. I mean, Justice Kagan, who's you know one of the liberals, brought this up several times. Is I think they're looking for a way to sort out the most egregious gerrymanders without causing the courts to have to intervene in every case. And for what it's worth, if you sort out the most egregious gerrymanders, that does a lot of work. I mean, you for one, you know, in Parker, you just have a ton of really bad gerrymanders right now. I mean, in Ohio, when President Obama won it in 2012, um, Republicans got three quarters of the seat of the congressional seat. That's an egregious gerrymander. You know, you have very similar lopsided gerrymanders at the congressional level in Michigan and Wisconsin and Virginia and Florida in Pennsylvania. So if you just get rid of the, the worst of the worst gerrymanders in states like those, you do a whole lot of work. Um, you know, and the other thing to keep in mind is that, you know, things do change over time. People move, you know, people get different ideas of, of, of who they may like. And so like in order for a gerrymander to have, sticking power, you, you, you know, 
it, it's pretty easy to draw a map that will determine what the next election will look like. But, but the problem we're seeing with these, ele- with these maps that are being drawn now is they're able to draw a map that rigs the next five elections. And if you rig the next five elections, after the fifth election, you've got to do your redistricting again. And so you just, you know, you just re-rig things. Right. And so if we can get to the point where we break that cycle, I, I, I mean, it might be difficult to prevent the party in power from rigging the next election. But if we can break this cycle where they're able to hold power until the next redistricting cycle and then use their control in the redistricting cycle, to continue the cycle over and over and over. So they control the legislature on and on unto infinity. That's going to do a whole lot of good. Well, I mean, is there there's no there's no way for the 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 court to create a mechanism, right? I mean, you would need a legislative fix in terms of like some type of preclearance or uh, right. I mean, there's no way to really do this, is there? I mean, it just uh, or yeah. I mean, the, yeah. I mean, there are a number of problems here. I mean, one problem is that I mean, problems that are just very difficult to fix. I mean. One problem is that sometimes you actually have to run an election under a map to know how bad the gerrymander is. Right. And so, you know, you you might need to run one election just to gather the data you need in order to prove to a court that the map needs to be struck down. So that's so that's one problem. Another problem is that lawsuits take a long time. And so, like, we see this over and over again in racial gerrymandering cases. You know, there's a case that's on its way up to the Supreme Court. Um, alleging a, ra- a racial gerrymander in Texas. Texas ran, uh, Texas ran four elections under this map that a lower, or, or they were in three elections under this map that, that the lower court said um, was an illegal racial gerrymander. And the Supreme Court just stayed that decision. So Texas is going get to get to run a fourth election right. under this map, which a court has said. So like, there are a lot of problems that, what you would want is something like the Voting Rights Act, where Congress steps in and you try to cut these things off at the pass. Um, but all of that said, you, you know, the, the nightmare scenario, and what we are headed towards right now is a world where you have infinite one party government, because if you can draw a map and hold it until the next redistricting cycle, you can control the government forever. Right. Um and so what will what in this event, would it just revert to the existing to the prior maps? Or would they um, have to redraw well, so them? Most likely what happens is they'd, is they'd have to redraw them. Um, and what happens in racial gerrymandering cases is most of the time they give the legislature a first crack at trying to draw maps that that aren't unconstitutional. And then the courts may may may, may dicker around with them. So, in other um, words, in the, cases, the, the court could say, we're going to send this back down to the circuit court. The circuit court is going to come up with a mechanism to make sure that you fix this. So you're going to have to redraw the right. maps and then submit it to the judge uh, who right. is going to theoretically apply these tests, uh, these models, and get a sense as whether or not it's within four to five percent or something. Right. Yeah. I mean, and, and that's. That's correct. I mean, the, the problem is, and this is why until we get some real legislation dealing with, I, I, I think that you're going to continue, continue to see gerrymandered maps, is it takes so long right. to, um, to go through the, the, the litigation process. And I mean, if you're a lawmaker who wants to protect your own seat and you draw a map and you, you, you hope it's going to protect your seat forever, but it only protects it for the next two elections, that's still two elections you don't have to worry about, so you're still going to do it. Yeah, um, it's yeah, um, it's uh, it, it, it you know you can only I guess break this uh, cycle. It's nice that you know uh, we have some type of of at least an open door from the court, or we might get right. one. Uh, but it's going to need some type of legislative fix, I think, down the road. All right. Well, let me just ask you about this then. Um, mm-hmm. The uh, Gorsuch, he comes yeah. off. Uh, there was a piece by uh, Jeffrey Tubin about an exchange between Gorsuch and Ginsburg. Yeah. Gorsuch uh, comes off. Uh, he starts off his question by saying, 
Maybe we can just for a second talk about the arcane matter of the Constitution, being somewhat sarcastic, yeah. implying that the Supreme Court justices are not um, thinking about the Constitution in some way. As right. they, I mean, which is just like, uh, just, I don't know how to articulate this other than to say, like, you just sounds like a dick. I mean, honestly, like, I, no, don't I, know, I don't know how else to express that. Uh, no, no, dick is a good word to describe <laughs> Judge Gorsuch. And um, so he goes on to say that um, there's no, the court has no authority to deal with uh, lines drawn by a state legislature. And then um, uh, Ginsburg mumbles more or less to the fact, or I don't know if she mumbled or grumbled, uh, where did one person more one, of a grumble? Where did one person one vote come from? In other words, saying, right. "Hey, um, where did we get that concept from? If there, if there's not, if those words aren't written in the Constitution, is that basically what went on there?" Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, like, I, I think that's all right. I mean, like, the first thing is that Gorsuch is such a smug prick. I, I, I mean, and this goes back, like, I mean, during his confirmation hearing. A lot of Democrats, my understanding from you know just my Capitol Hill sources, there are a decent number of Democratic senators who decided to vote against him, not because they like necessarily came into the confirmation fight wanting to cast a no vote, but because they found him to be such a jerk. Um, I mean, he he routinely lectures his colleagues, all of whom have been there longer than him, um, on like how they. They should be doing how they should be doing their job. He, you know, at his hearing, there's this, you know, if you watch a lot of confirmation hearings, there's this sort of like ritualized obsequiousness that every nominee has where, you know, thank you, Senator. I appreciate the question, Senator. If I have the honor of being confirmed, you know, they go out of their way to appear humble. And he couldn't even pretend to be humble for a few days. I mean, he, he, he is that guy. You know, he, he, is, he is the most obnoxious co-worker you have ever had. He is the frat boy who felt entitled to everything that we all went to college with. That's who Neil Gorsuch is. And what was flabbergasting about this exchange, I mean, there's lots of things that are flabbergasting about it. I mean, it, it's that if you take what he says seriously, and he actually thinks that the Constitution has nothing at all to say about redistricting. That means that all of the racial gerrymandering cases are wrong. That means that the one person, one vote case, as, as Ginsburg pointed out, was wrongly decided. You know, no justice goes that far. You know, not even Justice Thomas go, goes that far. Um, and, you know, on top of that, you know, if you read the whole exchange, it sounded like part of what he was trying to do was to trick Paul Smith, the, the, the voting rights lawyer, into going down a road that would lead him saying that these aren't cases, these are things that have been resolved by Congress and not by the courts. And I mean, and the thing I'll say about that is that Paul Smith is one of the smartest attorneys in the, on the planet. You know, Paul Smith it was, he was, when he was in private practice, he was the Democratic Party's go-to guy for major redistricting redistricting cases before the Supreme Court. He also argued and won Lawrence v. Texas, um, the major gay rights decision. He's, um, he, he, is, uh, he did a lot of really interesting telecom work. Super, super. You're not going to trick Paul Smith. And the idea that Gorsuch thought he was so smart that he could trick Paul Smith I, I mean, it just fits with everything else he's done. All the time he spends lecturing his colleagues. You, you know, I, I feel bad for the eight justices who, you know, were, 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 you know, I mean, we've all had an obnoxious co-worker show oh, up. Oh, believe me. And he, he is the worst. I mean, it, you know, he, I, 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 mean, I, I feel bad for all of them. I even feel bad for Alito well, that, that they have to tolerate this guy. Well, and that's. That's probably helpful on some level, right? When we have like a guy like Kennedy there who you would uh, anything that uh, in any way alienates him from uh, those four, I, it seems to me, is is a positive. All right. So let me just ask you this one question. Then we'll just go quickly. We'll just take a couple of minutes to go through the um, the big cases that people should be aware of. And then we will end up sure. discussing those as they come. But uh, tomorrow on this program, I'm going to run an interview I did with uh, Lawrence Lessig. 
about a case that uh, he is um, uh, basically trying to to get off the ground with mm -hmm. a plaintiff in a um, a Republican voter in a blue state and a Democratic voter in a red state. Uh, David Boyes has said that he will uh, be he will take this case. Um, I don't know if on 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 that level, but on on a Supreme Court level where they are attempting mm -hmm. to use the principle of one person, one vote to say that the way that states uh, allocate their electoral votes by doing mm -hmm. winner take all is uh, denying uh, essentially equal protection uh, under that one person, one vote uh, doctrine. Was there anything that came up in this case that could possibly implicate that one? Uh, I mean, it's clear Gorsuch doesn't necessarily believe in that concept. Uh, right. But, but it, it, it seems to me that on some level it was affirmed by, you know, that, that theory was affirmed by a majority of justices. I don't know if it will in that court. I'm just curious. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm vaguely familiar with Lessig's theory, and I'm frankly a little skeptical of it. Um, but, like, I mean, to answer your question, I don't, I don't think any I, – I can't think of any, anything that was said in yesterday's argument that really implicates it. And the reason why is it was such an unusual argument. I mean, normally when the justices hear a constitutional case, the question is, does this thing violate the Constitution? And like I said, with the exception of Gorsuch – no one really made the case or, you know, seemed to be making the case that partisan gerrymandering is constitutional. The argument was all about, like, is there a way that courts can figure out which maps are gerrymandered in a way that is accurate enough that they can actually start striking down these unconstitutional maps? Right. And, and is there a is there a bar that's been set? as to like how gerrymandered something is before it becomes unconstitutional. Like obviously the act well, of gerrymandering right. is, it could be like, we've, you know, we have a, a 0.02% efficiency right. gap uh, versus a 23% efficiency gap. I and mean, where right. is that, where's that line? Or is that not drawn either? Yeah. I mean, that's what this case needs to decide. And I mean, eventually the court is going to is going to have to draw some kind of line like that. You know, it's what happened in the one person, one vote cases. So one person, one vote is the theory that all of your congressional districts and all of your state legislative districts have to be roughly the same number of people um, you know, because you, you, know, you used to have this problem where you had states where like in the rural district, you'd have you, 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 each rural voter essentially had four times as much representation because they had so many fewer voters in their districts than, their, than, than in urban districts. Um, and so now, you know, the number of districts has to be roughly the same. And the, the way that the Supreme Court has put meat on those bones is they've said that basically you get a 10 percent play in the joint. Um, you know, the Supreme Court will generally presume that a district, that districts are OK if there's only a 10 percent variation between the highest population district and the lowest population district. I suspect you'll see something similar emerge from the court where they'll say, look, like so long as your map is not within this range, like so long as it only tends to advantage one party or another, you know, this this relatively small amount. We're going to presume it's fine because drawing an absolutely perfect map is very, very difficult. Um, but if you get more aggressive than that, um, and if you, you know, you cross a certain threshold, then we're going to give it a very, very hard look, and you better have a really good explanation for why it turned out the way it did. Okay, great. Um, all right. Well, uh, then I guess it just remains to be seen um, uh, just how far. How important, how sold Anthony Kennedy was that his ask uh, 15 years ago, uh, more or less, was answered. Um, and and I guess we will know that probably closer to the spring, right? Yeah, probably in June. This will probably be one of the cases that they hold on to for a really long time. OK, so let's talk about just some of the other big ones that are going to be coming up in this term. Uh, obviously, Neil Gorsuch is, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of pre preening, I think, from this guy. 
but mm. there's another voting rights case that's coming up. Um, Husted v. Philip Randolph Institute. Is that an right. impo- tell us about that one briefly? I mean, this is this is an important case. I mean, it's not as important as the gerrymandering case. This is a voter purge case um, where, like, you have this practice in Ohio where what they want to do is they want they want to be able to send send you a letter saying, "Hey, like, you haven't voted in a while. If we don't hear from you soon, we're going to uh, we're, we're going to strip away your your, your right to vote." Oh, we're not going to strip away you, right? We're going to deregister you so that you have to re-register again if you want to vote. And then, like, sometime later, if they don't hear back from you, they will, in fact, deregister, pull you off of the rolls. Um, and there's a very complica- complicated and not especially clearly drafted statute um, which deals with situ- with which deals with these purges. And, you, you know, it's... There are some judges who have said that they think that these purges are allowed, some that think that they, that they aren't allowed. Unfortunately, I think that the fact that the Supreme Court took this case, where the court below said that they are not allowed, is that there's probably five justices ready to reverse, and they're going to allow these purges. Hmm. Um, and that's not great. I mean, it, it's not a, an earthquake. I don't think it's going to cause as much damage to our elections as, say, voter ID does. But, you know, the, the strategy from a lot of conservative policymakers is you chip away, you knock a few thousand voters off the rolls here, you prevent a few thousand over there from voting, you, you, you make it a little harder to vote over there. And after a while, you add up to enough people aren't, who aren't able to cast a ballot that a bunch of races that would have gone to Democrats wind up going to Republicans. Right. I mean, there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, argument that the, the things like cross check and, and, and whatnot like that have have disenfranchised um, tens of thousands of voters, if not more. Right. Um, all right. Well, let's right. let's talk about um, uh, the um, uh, we have some labor cases. I mean, obviously, yeah, Janice V. asked me. Um, we've already mentioned on this show, but uh, why don't you just do a roundup of it? This is basically Friedrich's um, redux. Right. Yeah. So right before Scalia died, the court, as you mentioned, heard a case called Friedrich's. Friedrich seeks to defund a lot of public sector unions. Um, the idea is that um, if you join, a, if, if you're in a unionized workplace, if you're a you do not have to join the union to get the benefits of being in the union. So like all the higher wages that unionized workers try to get all the better benefits, you get all of those too, regardless of whether or not you join. And so what a lot of union contracts say is, you know, if you don't want to join, that's your right, but you do need to reimburse us your fair share of the cost of bargaining on your behalf. Because if people don't have to reimburse the union, what happens is that the union is starved for funds and then no one gets any of the benefits of being in the union because the union collapses. Um, this case seeks to eliminate these. They're, they're, they're sometimes called agency fees. This is called fair share fees. These fees that are charged to non-union members that they pay their fair share of the bargaining process. It seeks to eliminate them entirely in the context of public sector unions. And in the very likely event, that the Supreme Court um, strikes down these agency fees, you're going to see a lot of unions go on there, and you're going to see a lot of unions shrink. Um, and uh, let's talk about uh, arbitration too. This is a, this is another big one. We've seen the Supreme Court uh, rule that um, you cannot have class action uh, cases uh, when uh, you know in terms of arbitration when it comes to things like. AT&T overcharging people three bucks a bill across an entire state, um, yeah. which is just absurd. But um, uh, tell us about the, the, the one in regards to uh, labor. Sure. So on um, this case, this was this was argued on Monday. Um, it, it's a group of three cases, and it, it deals with this expansion of forced arbitration clauses that has really been going on for the last 30 years or so. So the history here is in 1925, the Supreme Court handed down, or rather the the Congress passed a law called the Federal Arbitration Act. 
Um, and what the FAA was supposed to do is it was supposed to allow sophisticated merchants to say, you know what, we don't, if we have a dispute with each other, we don't want to deal with litigation. We'll just hire an arbitrator, and whatever the arbitrator says, we'll agree to be bound by it. And, and that's fine. Like if two people who are sophisticated or two companies that are sophisticated with IO, eyes open want to do that, great. Um, but beginning in the 1980s, the Supreme Court started to expand this arbitration so that companies could say to their consumers and eventually to their workers, hey, if you want to do business with us, you want to buy a cell phone, you want to have a bank account, you want to put your mother in a nursing home, or you want to work for us, you have to agree to forced arbitration. You, 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 can't, you can't go to a real court. you got to go to an arbitrator. And there's all kinds of data showing that the arbitrators tend to be more favorable to the companies than they are to the individuals. There's a lot of reasons for this. One of them is the fact that the companies tend to know who the good arbitrator or the arbitrators are that they want and individuals don't. Um, and so the arbitration winds up being very favorable. Um, this case layers an additional layer on top of it. It says that in addition to having to go to an arbitrator, you can't bring a class action. Um, a class action is when many people join together under a single lawsuit. And what they are mostly useful for is when you have a bunch of people who are cheated out of a little bit of money. So if a company cheats thousands of its workers out of a few hundred dollars in wages, none of them are going to sue individually because the cost of litigating that case is going to be more than a few hundred bucks. But if they can join in a class action, then it's one big suit. You can get an att one attorney to represent all of them. It's super easy. This case wants to cut off those class actions. And what you're going to get if you don't have class actions is a lot of wage staff. All right. And lastly, we have a RIFRA case as well, right? Uh, this involves the, um, the, the, the baker. Oh, this is the cake baker. Yeah, this isn't a RIFRA case. A RIFRA is a federal law dealing with religious freedom. This is a constitutional case. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so the issue here is that you have this baker who doesn't want to serve a same-sex couple because, you know, that's what he thinks God doesn't want him to do. Um, and he, you know, so he discriminated against the same sex couple. And now he's claiming that he has a constitutional right to not follow his state's anti-discrimination law, both because he has a religious objection to it and also because he claims that he is an artist and he makes cake art. And as a cake artist, you cannot force him to make art for someone, you know, that expresses a message that he doesn't want to express because that would be a violation of his free, of his free speech rights. And, and so basically what the, what the, I get the sense that here, you're a little skeptical of cake art, uh, Ian. I, I, I mean, I, I am skeptical of this legal theory. Um, and the reason why I'm skeptical of this legal theory is because I don't think it had, I don't think you can draw a line to limit. It. I, I mean, one of the, you know, two of the most seminal civil rights cases from the, from the 1960s involving um, the ban on whites only lunch counters involved barbecue restaurants. And I, I mean, I, I am from the South. Like, barbecue is something we take seriously down there. And, and I mean, people, you know, people who make good barbecue are artists. But does that mean that, like, if I have a barbecue restaurant and I don't want to follow the law that says that I, that I have to serve black people, that I can claim, oh, well, I am an artist, and therefore the law doesn't apply to me. Um, so I, I think that it's going to be very hard for the Supreme Court to draw to draw a box around this rule. And I think the courts are going to find they're not very good at sorting out what kind of work is artistic and what kind of work is not artistic. Um, but, you know, the, old, the the real question here is... Is that what it's going to come down to, as to whether or not they have the ability to say that this is... Um, this is... This is art? I mean, is that really going to be what it comes down to? Because obviously, like, they, they, there, there, there is a line, right? I imagine if the guy came and said, like, "Well, I'm a painter, and I've been commissioned," you know, they came and came to me as. Wouldn't the question be more about like you have a store that's open to the public, right? right. It's not personal services that you're selling. You're selling right. cakes. This is a. Uh, a commercial entity you are 
you have a storefront. I mean, that those seem to be yeah. the ones that they could make that determination, no? Yeah, well, so here's what I think is the right rule. And, and oddly enough, this is the rule that the Trump administration proposed in its brief. They just didn't use their own rule correctly. So I think the rule should just be like, if if the gov- if there's a law that effectively requires me to make some kind of work of art, and you would think by me making this that it is me saying whatever message this art is, spo- is, is supposed to convey. So, like, you know, if, if there is a law that, like, you know, forces me to paint a painting that says Donald Trump, is, that, that conveys the message that Donald Trump is awesome, and, you know, you would think that was my message and not the person who hired me to make the painting, um, then I think that crosses a line. But, you know, I mean, this guy's a baker. I, I mean, when you buy a cake from a baker, no one thinks that, like, by selling you a cake, this baker is endorsing your marriage. You, you know, I mean, what, I, I think back to my own wedding and, like, I would have been – creeped out i mean like we we hired this this lovely pastry chef to make this the spread of desserts and they were wonderful and i would have been creeped out if i found out that this woman like looked at me and looked at my wife and judged our marriage to be morally good enough that she was willing to make a sticky toffee pudding cake for us no like you know the the re the my like the fact that she made cakes for my wedding conveys the message that she is in the business of baking cake and that's it you know um, and i'm so going to have to revisit what i've been telling my four-year-old son uh on his birthday with the cupcakes <laughs> because we present him the cupcakes and we say see the bakery loves you <laughs> well you know maybe maybe, maybe this anti-gay cake baker should win then um, but no, I mean, I it's going to break his heart. It's going to hire... break his little heart when he finds out that the, the, the cupcake maker just makes cupcakes. <laughs> that, that's amazing. Yeah. No, but I mean, I just think when you hire a vendor, like, you know, the message that the vendor is saying by being your client or by, by taking you on as a client is that I take clients to do this sort of work. Right. That's it. Right. All right. Well, fair enough. Is there anything else you think that we should be watching out for in this term? Well, the the one thing looming over this term is the Muslim ban, which they were going to hear an oral argument on next week. Trump announced that he's going to change the ban. And now the court asked for briefing on whether or not the case is moot. I think, you know, regardless of whether it's moot or it needs to be what's called remanded to a lower court, I think the responsible thing would be for the Supreme Court to kick it back down to a lower court somehow, because the Supreme Court of the United States, the court of last resort, shouldn't be the first one to look at a brand new policy. We should let other judges look at it first. Um, but one way or another, the the legality of you know this now many times changed Muslim ban is going to have to be resolved and probably resolved by the Supreme Court of the United States. Right. All right. Well, Ian uh, Milheiser, thank you so much for uh, this rundown of of what we can expect in this term, or at least uh, what we know they're going to be um, uh, looking at. Uh, uh, really appreciate it. And um, and uh, we will have you back as these courts are heard and we, we get a better sense of where uh, of 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 where the justices stand to the extent that we can divine from from the oral arguments. Thank you so much. All right. Sounds great. Thanks, Sam. Ian Melheiser, Justice Editor of Think Progress, author of Injustices, Supreme Court's History of Comforting the Comfortable and Afflicting the Afflicted. Thanks again, Ian. All right, folks. Going to take a quick break um, and head into the fun half. There is a chance we're going to have a uh, surprise guest on in the uh, fun half um and if uh, it does happen uh we'll see but um i got a little I david got, dane does not count as a surprise guest sam no, just to be clear no david dane does not okay i mean when he calls in surprise it's a surprise uh i did uh, like i said i got a, i got a call earlier from uh washington dc during the break i didn't take it i just thought 
It's just another person from Washington calling me. Well, I thought you thought it was one of those uh, those those, py- those cruise pyramid schemes. That's that exactly you get it's with the, all the time. I get. <laughs> I get about. I have never seen anybody I get, about, get more like congratulations. Would you like to fly? That? I don't know why I do Lindsey Graham. How great would that be if Lindsey Graham moonlighted as a as well? A the thing is, they're not real people. They're always recordings of people that make them but sound you, like they're. You they're people. take the process, so you get to a real person. Yes, and I do take it that far. Goes, Thank you very much. <laughs> and they go, all right, sir. Uh, there is actually some room over on that first class uh, yacht that we're charting out over there to the Bahamas, and uh, I'm just going to need your social security number and uh, blood sample in the mail. Uh, he will be uh, calling in at, um, I believe, around quarter of two. If uh, if we do get that call, he is a senator from the state of Vermont. Patrick Leahy. <laughs> I've never talked to Patrick Leahy. I don't know why he would call me. But, uh, He's getting stoked. We'll see. <laughs> I don't know. I would, he landed Leahy finally. Leahy. <laughs> um, Leahy was in a Batman movie. I know that. Yeah. Um, all right, folks. We're going to take a quick break, and uh, when we come back, we will have uh, some some fun half for you. Uh, we have all sorts of sound, like I say, that um, I think is prima facie uh, evidence of uh, that could get uh, Donald Trump uh, committed. Um, Honestly, just crazy. Also, this story uh, by ProPublica of Ivanka and Junior, who are on the brink of facing fraud charges because of what they told potential buyers about their Soho project and the way in which this investigation went away is a real problem. We'll also talk about the knives that must be out for Tillerson. And who those who might be holding those knives. Uh, we got a lot to talk about and we will talk about it. We also got uh, a lot of sound. Uh, we'll be right back. Don't forget, folks, this show depends on your membership for 96.3% of its revenue. Now that's a lagging uh, number. It could could have gone up by point uh, two or down by point two, because we always our our accountants in the back room are always constantly churning away and uh, developing spreadsheets for us, and then we have to learn how to open them each time when they email them to us. So that may accounting be accounting is so uptight. The accounting is they're breathing down our necks. The real folks. ball busters. Um, don't forget, just coffee, do co op, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Also, last night's TMBS, the Michael Brooks show, some people call it, um, is available. Um, you can check it out uh, on iTunes or on uh, YouTube. And uh, who'd you have on last night? Had on uh, ContraPoints. ContraPoints? Yeah. Who's brilliant. Like she does a, a YouTube channel dealing with she actually knows what she's talking about when it comes to things like free speech. All of these like terms that have come to be a stand in for like stupid people in our current environment. She actually trained in philosophy. Um, she's that was a really interesting conversation. And then uh, Bree Joy Gray uh, on as well on uh, capitalism and cultural appropriation. I've watched a bunch of uh, ContraPoints videos. I like them. Really smart. And also, like, actual, like, very high production value. Yes. They're very interesting they're, they're to watch. Like she's making, like, almost short films. Yes. Like, it's, it's not just commentary. Yes. All right. And uh, lastly, if you buy your crap from Amazon or Jet.com, do so through our link at MajorityReportKickback.com. Quick break. We'll be right back.
We are back, uh, ladies and gentlemen. The fun half of the majority report is uh, is taking place at this very moment as we speak. It is happening. I don't know. Can you can you sense it? Can you feel it? <laughs> uh, folks. What? There was a rumor going about right wing circles and i was i was tracking i was sort of like i saw it in one or two places i said that can't be the case the day after maria truck drivers in puerto rico would decide to go on strike that's not a terribly smart strike strategy i didn't see anything else i thought there's no one who would believe that? So this is one of those right-wing fever swamp rumors that no one would believe. Well, I'm not so sure I was right. Here's Donald Trump <laughs> upon returning from Puerto Rico. In Texas and in Florida, we get an A-plus. And I'll tell you what, I think we've done just as good in Puerto Rico, and it's actually a much tougher situation. Uh, but now the roads are cleared, communication starting to come back. We need their truck drivers. Their drivers have to start driving trucks. We have to do that. So at a local level, they have to give us more help. So there you have it. Uh, we have a different, uh, I sent you a separate uh, video of that where we actually see him saying that. Um, but nevertheless, here is... <laughs> Um, CBS News, David Bergnaud speaking with Puerto Rico's uh, Public Service uh, Commission spokesperson about whether or not truck drivers were not driving for a specific reason other than the fact that there was a massive hurricane which made it impossible for anybody to do anything the first day. Many of you have written to me asking, is it true that truckers have gone on strike? And is that why the government hasn't had the truckers that they need to distribute the supplies? It is not true. It's false. Um, and I have a representative with the government, uh, Leticia Corver. I've been, I've been practicing my Spanish, if you'll forgive me. Um, but she is a spokesperson for one of the agencies that deals with transportation. Uh, the Public Service Commission. The Public Service Commission. So many people have asked, is it true? Are the are the truck drivers on strike? Is that they're why the supplies are not getting? No, they're not on strike and they're yep. actually all working. Right. So we've uh, stationed uh, in Sagrado Corazon a place for the private sector and for them to contract with the with the trucks. So everyone's working and the supplies are getting to where they have to. So there it is. Oh, I okay, whatever. Yeah, it was like she said, they need to get back in their trucks. I don't know. I heard somebody say it on the Oh, on wait, the radio. oh, actually, reset. They're not striking. That's what I said. Unbelievable. <laughs> That's, who said that I thought they were striking? I know they're not striking. Incidentally, this is the president of the United States. If he had a question as to whether or not there was a truck strike going on in Puerto Rico the days after the hurricane, he could have turned to anyone and ask the question to get an answer. And it gives you a sense of just like sort of how involved this guy is in these major questions. And people Not say so that. much. People say I'm a fucking moron. Meanwhile, I'm on top of literally everything. Think, should I threaten to I was way out ahead of people on the truck strike thing. Nobody knew that was going on. That came from Conservative Treehouse that originated that claim. Oh, that's a great go. website. Now, I should I go threaten to nuke North Korea or call a black guy a kid for not playing football? It's Treehouse. Why would, why would they say something wrong? Um, I love it. Here that is a compilation from Chris Hayes' program last night. And it's not even a broad compilation. It's just a little bit of, uh, you know, there's a couple of cuts in here that if Ivanka and Donald Jr. and uh, the rest of them want to someday commit their father 
and deem him legally incapacitated, I suspect that they may actually use as a major piece of evidence to submit to a court if they were looking for, you know, a magistrate to sign off on the incompetency form or whatever it is. This is Donald Trump in Puerto Rico, in a country, excuse me, in a, an island a with a colony, essentially, an occupied territory yeah. of 1.5 million American citizens who do not have drinking water, more who don't have electricity. I mean, untold amounts of damage in terms of houses. And this is what he has to say. In Las Vegas t tomorrow, but today he visited Puerto Rico to tour the hurricane ravaged island and meet with residents and local officials who've been begging for help for more than a week. This is what they got at the first event after the president landed. Brock Long has been uh, through a lot. Brock has been unbelievable. Your governor has been who I didn't know. I heard very good things about him. He's not even from my party. And he started right at the beginning appreciating what, he, what we did. Right from the right, beginning. Pause it for one second. The governor is sitting next to him, realizing that <laughs> this guy is stands between my territory uh, getting perhaps maybe drinking water uh, or not. And so I'm going to sit here and pretend like I don't think he's crazy. And as the, the event goes on, this round table they're sitting at, it becomes clearer and clearer that like it's just his eyes are popping out of his socket. He, he can't believe how crazy Donald Trump is. And you notice that Donald Trump said, like, um, you just dial it back a little bit. You can hear him stumble over what we did. He wanted to say what I did. Trump said, like, he really is appreciative for what, I, what we did. Go. He's been who I didn't know. I heard very good things about him. He's not even from my party. And he started right at the beginning appreciating what, he, what we did. Right from the beginning, this governor did not play politics. He didn't play it at all. He was saying it like it was, and he was giving us the highest grades. So Congresswoman Jennifer Gonzalez Colon, who I've uh, watched the other day, and she was saying such nice things about all of the people that have worked so hard. I saw those comments, and everybody saw those comments, and we really appreciate it. And I also want to thank Linda McMahon, small business. She has done an incredible job, built a great company with her husband, Vince McMahon. We want to thank you, Linda, very much. Look how Mick gracious I'm being. I'm being so gracious. Right there, and Mick is uh, in charge of a thing called budget. Now, I hate to tell you, Puerto Rico, but you've thrown our budget a little out of whack because we've spent a lot of money on Puerto Rico, and that's fine. The guy is making jokes about about the fact that this huge, massive, ongoing disaster it's costing us a little money. It's a, I spent a little bit more on this project than I wanted, but it turned out great. The bathtub looks beautiful. The bazaza tile in the bathrooms look great. I know you spent a little more than we wanted to, but okay. I mean, that's exactly Saving some lives. Guy has no idea what context he's in. It's a little thing called budget. Ever heard of it? Go, and that's fine. We've saved a lot of lives. If you look at the... Uh, every death is a horror. But if you look at a real catastrophe like Katrina, and you look at the tremendous hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people that died. Now, what is your, what is your death count as of this moment? 17? 16 certified. 16 people certified. 16 people versus in the thousands. Uh, you can be very proud of all of your people, all of our people working together. I mean... He's a, he's a, uh, you know, he's like a, a real, a real tragedy like Katrina. I, I mean, it's just. The guy doesn't have. 
normal capacity, ability to to function. I mean, I, you know, I, I don't. I, I don't know what else to say. I mean, this there, is there just is, sheer lunacy. There isn't much else to say. But, I mean, I, look, it's not nearly as bad uh, as this. But even in Harvey, he went to Texas and he would he was like, it's a lot of rainfall. Isn't that right. unbelievable? Yep. <laughs> like, and then, of course, there was the, you know, isn't this a great crowd, you know, yep. which is what you'd expect from him because he's totally demented with stuff like that. But he was getting, like, excited like a kid watching a movie about the amount of rain yeah no there's something really off and the and, and you know of course the the problem uh for puerto rico in part obviously the hurricane is the major problem uh and uh, the pounding they have taken from hedge funders and people who have leveraged uh, that uh, territory and the, and the Jones Act and all of these things. But the, the immediate, the most immediate problem is that Donald Trump has no reason to care about Puerto Rico other than the fact that he was shamed. And you could see that uh, is clearly resonated with him. Because he's like, it's not my Katrina. Katrina was bad. This is like, fine. But George W., not a great president. Not a great president. And his he, his brother he, was a loser, and everybody thought he would beat me, but he didn't. <laughs> Do you guys remember that? Yes. <laughs> it just turns into... And I would have beat Hillary if three million of you people didn't vote illegally. All right, lastly... We've shown you the the clips of, of Trump's like opening remarks, I guess, where he's trying to shame the mayor of San Juan by saying that all these other people have been really appreciative of everything we've done. Here he is. He must think. I, I'm the only thing that this reminds me of is like when you'd see. Guys rolling on tanks through Italy as they are liberating Italian towns, uh, you know, once uh, the, the Americans and the Allied forces have invaded uh, uh, Europe in World War II, and they would hand out, like, here's gum to the kids and whatnot. Here's Donald Trump basically throwing out canned goods and paper towels like he was a mascot at a football game throwing out T-shirts to people. And then he has an exchange with uh, a, um, a woman where he's completely mystified about the idea of dropping these, uh, what are they, iodine tablets or something like that, into water to purify it so that you don't die when you drink it on an island where there's no uh, drinkable water for 1.5 million Americans. There he is, throwing paper towels like they're shooting hoops. Who wants a can? Can I throw these? Um, probably shouldn't. Probably shouldn't throw the can. Unbelievable. Wait, why would you do that? And why don't you just thing. get a bottle of Evian? It's it is so clear. There is no one around Donald Trump to instruct him on even the most basic level of like, hey man, the optics. Even just like saying like, uh, Mr. President, the optics of this might not be so great. You throwing towels to the masses. Tone it down? Okay. Uh, I mean, it's it's crazy. All right, we're not getting a call today. Oh, shit, really? Nope. Uh, we'll do it next week. Damn it, Leahy. Yeah. God damn it. Come on, Leahy. Get on your game. State senator. <laughs> State senator I, from Vermont. Oh. Bill Stevens. Now, what would a good Vermont state senator name be? Jim Peterson. Yeah, something like that. 
Patrick, calling from Patrick a, Leahy the third. Calling from a five seven one area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hi, my name's Colin. I live in the uh, Fairfax area in Virginia. And what's on your mind? Well, first off, thank you for taking the call. Um, so, I was listening to the, the show yesterday where Michael was talking to a, a lady that lives in Texas, and she has a lot of evangelical family members. Yeah. So... My thought when I was hearing that was thinking about uh, Betsy DeVos. Um, you know the organization Amway, right? Yes, she. Uh, that's her family money. Yes. So, well, it's more than just her family money. It's, it's also how they get people to convert to evangelicals. I didn't know that. So, once upon a time when I was about 14 or 15 and I had an old, I have an older brother that was very involved in this organization at the time. And, uh, well, little brothers follow their older brothers cause sure. It, yeah. That's how the relationship works. But, um, basically when you go to their, uh, business conferences four times a year and you pay hundreds of dollars to go there and well, they make money from that. Um, most of the time there, they spend it telling you about evangelical belief systems. Mm. Like you, you might actually sit there Sunday morning for their quote unquote non-denominational uh, service. When you would have a gentleman named, Bill Britt, he's no longer around, but 15 years ago, he was one of the biggest names in Amway. And he would literally stand on stage and say, during the, uh, what's, uh, what's the term when, starts with an R, <laughs> when everyone's supposed to go up to heaven. Revelation. There you go. That's the one. Rapture. He'd literally rapture, say, rapture, 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 he rapture. would ask God. Rapture. Thank you. Ra that's the one. Uh, he'd literally say while he was on stage that he would ask God if he could zap people. If he could zap people? Yeah, yeah. You know, he would stand on stage and pretend that he would zap people. Like, like God would be striking them with lightning, pretending that he would have that power. Hmm. Sam does that. <laughs> like, I'm, he goes, Hi, Shem, can I zap the them, please? Thing that was said on stage by someone making millions of dollars a year through the, uh, the DeVos and Van Andel family, their organization of Amway. Well, I mean, look, she is on record as saying that um, they want public education she doesn't believe in public schools. She believes in public education. What she means is public funding for basically Christian schools. Um, I mean, that yeah. is, I mean, this is, none of, none of what I'm saying is controversial. Uh, there have been mm -hmm. numerous interviews with her and her husband through the years. And, you know, that's, that's, that's what it is. Um, yeah. And. Well, no. I'm not just talking about like like school programs. This is how they indoctrinate adults into converting into evangelicals. Like my older brother, once upon a time, called himself an atheist. He is now a born again Christian that votes for Ted Cruz. Mm. Is he making more money now? So it, it's not just school. It's this is how they're 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 getting people that are full grown adults to start voting a different way. It's, well, it's, it's I can not tell you, just I mean, political. that's that's fine, but I can tell you that, uh, broadly speaking, uh, Amway isn't mm -hmm. big enough. Like, they they just don't have um, enough people who are, um, there's just not enough people who are, who are uh, either pumping out because the, the numbers are diminishing. Now, with that said, they are very uh, passionate voters, and that goes a long way. I mean, I've said 
for a long time, people, you know, well, back when we were on uh, Air America, people would say, yeah, do you really, what's the value of preaching to the choir? And I'm like, you know what? Uh, that's, <laughs> all you need really is the choir um, in American politics. <laughs> And you just need to make sure that the, the choir is uh, revved up. I mean, we see this in the gun debate, frankly. I mean, that's what's going on, is that uh, there are much fewer people who are rabid uh, Second Amendmenters, but they are, I should, there are much fewer people who are, um, who interpret the Second Amendment um, the way the Supreme Court does than the rest of us, but they, um, they're much more passionate and that makes a big difference. But I appreciate the call. Yep. Hashem. Thank you. Thanks for time. Have a good day. You Hashem, too. give me the power to zap Jimmy Dore. <laughs> give me the lightning bolts from my fingertips so I'll that I may Honestly, smite him. Hashem. If, Shalom. I, I mean, it would be, I, I would not want to be Jimmy Dore if uh if i kick it and ability. have that ability you know god ends up giving me that ability god make me lex luther for one day one <laughs> or even why not superman why not but i okay but superman had a code of conduct that i don't want to follow god damn it well that's true too i, I don't, don't want to eat. just save children from burning buildings i want to settle scores <laughs> Sure. I'll do both. I'll save the children and I'll go back to old casting directors at the same goddamn Ca day. No, I have no problem with casting no, directors. I know. Calling uh, 610. There's Jimmy, a couple of writers Jimmy I have a problem with. Calling from the 610 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hey, Sam. It's Mike from PA. How are you? Mike from PA. What is happening? Oh, I'm glad you called. I have a question for you. Um, Shoot. Jess King. Pennsylvania's 16th Congressional District. Jeff King. Uh, I don't know him. I'll have to check him out. It's a she, but okay. Okay. Jeff, you said? Jess. Or Jeff? Jess. Jess, okay. Hmm, doesn't ring any bells, but I'll check her out. Okay, appreciate well, that's that. That's a little south of my spot, but I, I understand. I'll, I'll, I'll take a look. Um. I wanted to call, I hope you don't mind, but uh, basically the woman who got me into progressive politics and taught me, you know, everything I know about organizing and kind of legendary person in, you know, eastern Pennsylvania, uh, unfortunately lost her sister in the Las Vegas attacks. <sighs> and I was acquainted with her, and it's <laughs> pretty brutal. And she didn't live in Vegas, she was just visiting and I don't know if you guys mind, but she has two college-age daughters. <laughs> Would you consider, you know, maybe if I gave a GoFundMe or something? Of course. Of course. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I understand. But this is, you know, it really hurts because this is just something that we lost a friend recently, you know, a couple years ago. Um who worked for like a local uh, controlling board and some crazy guy came in and shot, shot him. And it's like nothing ever seems to, <clears throat> I'm sorry. <laughs> it happens so often and yeah. it hurts so many people. And it's like, <laughs> what will it get to make this country wake up and, you know, not accept this. This is not normal. Like, you know, this many people shouldn't be dying, you know, going to work or going to a concert. And, you know, it's for me, it's just, it's disgusting. <laughs> and, there, you know, there's, we can't accept it. We can't just be cynical and go, well, nothing will never change because politicians are bought. No, you can change it. You need to make them scared of us. Get pissed. Well, I you think, know, I mean, honestly, I, I think the story is not just about money. I mean, I think the money is, um, is part of it, but you know, and, and this is sort of, this is consistent with what you're saying that 
it really is the fact that the NRA can mobilize voters um, and, you know, beyond just like the 25 grand they give somebody, they can they can impact an election. And until. Yeah. Well, you need people need to start being single issue voters about gun control. I mean, you need to start saying, like, no, I'm not going to vote for you if you if you think that it's OK that. 400,000 Americans have died since 9-11 from gun violence. So, like, this is insane. And you can't get away with it. You can never buy a gun, do everything you can to stay away from gun culture, and then you go to a concert and you'll get gunned down. You know, you'll just try to be a public servant and doing some small little municipal board that barely anyone goes to and some crazed lunatic will come in and gun you down. (laughs) <laughs> it's, and that doesn't even get into the the poverty and what's happening in our cities. It's disgusting. And how many people kill themselves because they have a momentary mental break of depression and the gun's right there and they yep. attempt suicide and they die. Yep. You know, it is... I mean, frankly, disgu- I mean, the suicide like, alone um, is a bigger... Um, is is it, when we're talking about sheer numbers, um, it is. I think we have more people who've died of uh, of 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 suicide by gun than may have been shot by gun by somebody else. Yeah, uh, <laughs> you know, actually, I was just reading that our uh, people killed by police would put us like pretty much on par with the gun violence that happens in Germany total so like our the amount of people being shot to death in this country is like war zone and and you should know people should know that the the amount of guns that are on the street also directly impact uh the the amount of people who are shot by police right because um yeah and and certainly they get away with saying they feel more threatened because people are aware of the exactly. fact that so many people have guns. Yeah, and this is, you know, I, I've heard, I've seen some people being like, well, you know, we can't disarm the Bush or the proletariat or whatever. And I have to tell you, like, this is madness. Um, we have to get these guns off the street. We have to, you know, this guy had no warning factors. But what reasons did he have for owning a gun? You know, in these other countries, you have to have a reason for owning a gun. You can't just have 50 guns that you and 20,000 rounds of ammunition for no reason. You have to store it safely. You have to get checked up on by law enforcement. You have to have mental health checks. Does this sound burdensome? Well, it saves tens of thousands of lives every year in Europe. So, you know, I just... I don't know what it's going to take, you know, this mobilization. You know, everybody who cares about guns is already voting on that issue, no matter what. Right. So it's pointless. Like, if you have a Democrat who says, well, you know, I don't really talk about guns. This is a mistake that I personally made, which is a shame to my, I'll never live this down, is I basically didn't even talk about it. I knew that the NRA was going to endorse my opponent. He was going to get an A+. And I talked to the gun control groups and said, hey, I'm with you. But I'm concerned that this is a, a you know a good issue for me to run on, and I would just kind of silent about it, cowardly, it was pathetic, and I'm disgusted that that's what I decided to do. And you know what? Did it matter? No. And so, but I could have, if I had changed a couple people's minds, if I had been more serious about it, maybe I could have made a difference. And I'm tired of like compromising because we think this is some sort of political thing. Because in 1996, the Republicans managed to get this one election and then so we have to end act like that is politics for good it's not we can change and yeah they're going to try to intimidate you you know when you're a legislator armed people come to you and say you better not vote against this you get harassed it's real i understand why people don't like to take this issue head on but you know when they banned guns in australia the prime minister came out in a bulletproof vest to give a speech after they had a mass shooting that was not as bad as this one. Mm. And he showed that courage. He 
<laughs> and you know what? Nothing happened, and their society's a lot better off. So, you know, sorry about getting emotional there yeah. um, earlier, but um, if you don't mind, I could send you that GoFundMe. And, yeah, what is, you know, do, you, do you have If anybody a, has a couple bucks. Well, we will I'm, post the I'm GoFundMe. Sure really What's the name it. of it, though, for people who, uh, is it? Is it easy to find? Yeah. I just uh, tweeted it, but uh, it is, um, hold on one sec. <clears throat> It is it's GoFundMe.com slash Anderson Family <laughs> dash Dorian Anderson. All right, we'll we'll put that on uh, on the site at uh, Majority dot FM. Um, appreciate uh, the call, Michael. Hang in there. Thanks, Adam. You have a good one. Bye bye. Right, you too. And and that. Uh, that pain. I mean, have you? I'm sure many of you have read some of the stories uh, coming out of Vegas. Just completely uh, heartbreaking and totally senseless. Totally senseless. Calling from an 828 uh, area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Eight two eight. Eight two eight area code. I'll get back to you. Calling from a two six seven area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hey guys, it's Fran from Philadelphia. Hi, Fran. Uh, I just uh, wanted to give you a follow up take on your uh, Millheiser interview um, about uh, Gil v. Whitford. Um, the First thing is just like how much I read, you know, I, I did some analysis on this and I like read the oral argument transcript and just how much of a smarmy dick that Gorsuch is. Like what, there's this one this terrible Gorsuch impression. You guys got to get a better one. But look, four lines here. He goes about, you know, social science. Uh, so, uh, Mr. S what's the formula that achieves that? It reminds me a little bit of my steak rub. I like some turmeric. I like a few other little ingredients, but I'm not going to tell you how much of each. And so what's this court supposed to do? A, a pinch of this, a pinch of that. Um, you know, it's like, I'm sure he's used that line, you know, many times in his life. Right. To like tear down this social science stuff. And the thing I, you know, that I, that I find is notable about all these conservative arguments in uh, surrounding this case in particular um, is that the you know the animosity to social science is pathological? So like I, I, you know even if they're not wrong to be skeptical, I'm not totally swayed by the uh, you know that we should be using these social science metrics that are being advanced by uh, you know Whitford's side. Um, uh, just like there, because there is underlying all of there's a, there's kind of a point that maybe is that you have to address that the conservatives are the conservative justice has made is that in the background of all of these uh, metrics is a comp is like what standard are you comparing it to and it is proportional voting and so that's kind of like the elephant in the room you know are we you know are can we have proportional voting or not? I mean the party in power is always going to say no we're a republic you know that's not how we we're not a that's not how we work. Um, but I, I think that's like at the heart of it really kind of is uh, a proportional mm -hmm. voting issue. What do you mean? What do you mean by that? Explain that. Well, the, the, yeah, yeah. So tell me, um, so the efficiency gap test is like how many votes are wasted. Right. You know, because, you know, you've already got you've already you've got the first to pass the post and you've got. Um, Right. So so uh, so you so, need 51 votes out of 100, let's say. The district has 100 people. Right. You need 51 votes. The efficiency gap is the delta between 51 and what the the number is. And they're arguing that in democratic districts, they've been drawn uh, in such a way that the efficiency gap may be 20 or 30 points that the Democrat may be winning like 81 to 19. 
And uh, in the district next to it, because they have carved out all the Democrats and put them in that one district, the Republican may reliably win 55 to 45 uh, because the, the, the 10 uh, percentage points were, were taken out of, of that Republican district and put into that heavily Democratic district. So that's the efficiency gap for people. And so all right, explain what you mean by proportional. Uh, a proportional representation, just meaning like if you got, uh, you know, if you got 48 percent of, the, you know, in the, in this case, Wisconsin, they, the Republicans get 48 percent of the vote, they get 60 seats in the legislature, you know, basically 60 percent. And uh, so the, you know, on a statewide level, the metric against, uh, get, you know, against which you're evaluating that gap is going to be is the representation more or less proportional. And I think most uh, people who, uh, who kind of say, oh, we're a democratic republic in the, you know, in, the, in the capital letters are going to say that that means we don't have proportional representation and that's how the system was envisioned. And I think that's, uh, that's, that's a precept that I think deserves some honest challenge. That's all. That's, that's my only that's my point there that the, about the, 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 pre, the precept that we weren't meant to be proportional deserves an honest challenge or vice versa. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, the in the there's this concept from Freud about uh, pathology that I think is like really apt here uh, in that, you know, you essentially just because your spouse is actually cheating on you doesn't mean that your jealous paranoia isn't pathological and the analogy here is you know just because there is reason to be skeptical of the social science uh you know that it could be manipulated so on and so forth doesn't mean that the skepticism from conservatives isn't pathological because it totally you know it is uh and the you know Breyer proposes uh this it'll be really interesting to see if, if kennedy uh, agrees with this, but Breyer, you know, he lays out a five-part test. I won't go through it, but the first prong is the question: Is was there one-party control of redistricting? And if there was, or sorry, if there wasn't one-party control, then end of question. That that that's as far as it needs to go. It's non-justiciable. Like no, it's right. totally a political question, not for the courts. But you go through the rest of the analysis on the asymmetry and so on and so forth. If there was one party control of redist redistricting, um, and I, you know, I think it's, it's going to be really interesting to see what happens because uh, the point that uh, maybe Milheiser kind of mentioned but was that kind of no matter what, this the district court's decision is going to be reversed and remanded, like a 100% certainty of that, because they're, the Supreme Court's not going to accept the test that they put forth, which was discriminatory intent, discriminatory effect, and no neutral justification. And so they're not, that, that's too open-ended. Uh, and so it's going, to, and so it's, it's So in other words, the Supreme Court is going to say, we have a lower bar for what crosses the threshold of being inappropriate. Uh, I mean, hopefully. But you're, this is what but, you're I mean, speculating. We have a lower bar. High, it's a higher bar. A higher bar. Yeah, that's what, that's what I mean. I think we're saying the same thing, but just looking at it differently. Like, you have to, uh, to in order for something to be unconstitutional, there's a higher standard that you have to uh, flunk. And and, uh, and so you're suggesting that they're going to um, they're going to they're going to raise that bar um, that. But so they're going to include the discriminatory intent, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I maybe I misspoke, but basically 100 percent chance of reversal. 60, I would say 60 percent chance of like a left positive result in that, uh, you know, these these are the the markers of whether something is unconstitutional. Right. Um, and right now, right now, conservatives get to say, oh, uh, you know, these are traditional districting criteria like compactness, uh, contiguousness, equal population, so on and so forth. Uh, and they kind of wrap themselves in this concept of traditional districting criteria, of course, completely obscuring the fact that these 
you know, just like Ginsburg grumble about where does one person, one vote come from? It, it, you know, it's not the Constitution. This, these traditional district criteria do not come from the Constitution. It's ultimately right. the same the same issue at uh, the thrust as uh, Obergefell in that, you know, traditional marriage. You know, where's where's that coming from? Uh, right. And I, I think um, it's, uh, you know, again, we're at we're, we're at. Kennedy's mercy. Uh, yeah, I mean the good news. I mean, on some, yeah, it's a sad state of affairs. The good news, and I'm trying to be very positive here, is that as long as he feels like he's he's the linchpin, maybe he stays longer. Yeah, I appreciate the phone yeah, call. I mean, I, absolutely. All right, take care, guys. It's. I mean, it's nice for one's ego to feel like they are the deciding vote, and right now. We all want Kennedy to stay there. Um, just briefly touching on the um, on the uh, the strategy by McConnell, Ryan, every other Republican. Apparently, they could not even get a Republican to come on Morning Joe for the past couple of days. Every single Republican has come out and said, now is not the time to discuss gun legislation because they wanted to wait a week when the media won't cover it. And then there are some, and these are all talking points that came out from the White House and others. I mean, this is standard, pretty standard stuff. They're all on message. Uh, Kennedy I don't know what her first name is, or maybe that's her first name. I don't know what her last name is. Kennedy, who uh, was the former VJ who became uh, a libertarian and is on Fox Business, um, made a point on Fox Business uh, show or whatever, uh, the Kennedy Watch, um, about how our reaction to guns is not consistent with the way that it would be if there was something else that injured people. Um, this is what passes. Remember, she's part of the thoughtful independent. In fact, that was the name of her last show, I think, the independence, the independent crew. And the president is now also faced with the screeching gun control debate, which never centers on intent or mental illness or the actual causes of horrific tragedies. If that psychopath had, God forbid, driven a truck into that crowd and killed 100 people, would we be talking about truck control or how trucks cause people to commit unimaginable acts of violence? No. But using logic and an emotional argument is a no-win in this climate. And don't expect gun control nuts to employ reason and facts anytime All right, soon. Stop. Okay, okay, yes, it's, it's so emotional. First off, we don't see that because there's something about guns, I think, that makes it far more exciting. But as to the question of would we be concerned about trucks slamming into, let's say, crowds of people or pedestrians. There is an image right now we are showing. It is of Fox News Studios. You will notice there are huge planters in front of there on 6th Avenue. Those are not because people feel we want small shrubbery on 6th Avenue. Those planters are made out of cement. In fact, they align much of the major thoroughways in New York City and Manhattan, specifically because they are protecting against people who might drive buses or trucks or cars onto the sidewalk to hurt people or to crash into, say, Fox News studios. You can see this in front of Donald Trump's uh, buildings. You can see it on Wall Street. You can see it lining 6th Avenue. You can see these barriers on 5th Avenue in some instances. So yes, even though we have not had an instance where someone has driven a bus into those things, we have already safeguarded large swaths of people. If you walk into Times Square, if you walk into uh, Macy's Square, 
these pedestrian areas, you will see the same huge. These are not like small, like little barriers that just signify don't come through here. They are large cement blocks that Never. prevent people from doing it. Now, she may not notice this when she walks out. Well, every time I walk by that building, I always notice the well, incredible on... insult to freedom that it is. I find it pretty shocking. But, that... but it could be that she's so caught up in her logic <laughs> that she's not taking time to smell the shrubbery in the large cement planters that are protecting her when she does her show. Did I get too emotional about that? I just feel like it's just really hypocritical. Unbelievable. When was she cool? Jerry. I didn't know that VJs were still a thing even. Well, she I mean she's a, she's she's a former VJ. Isn't that really of like the 90s? I, I think And if she can get a job, why the hell I, I got to think that she was the that 80s. Bill Bellamy guy. Was she was she in the 90s? I don't know. I I don't know. I mean, I don't recognize her I, from the 90s, but I, was, I, did I not wouldn't be have, watching the type of music that she would put on. My, my dad did not get cable until um, I left the house for college. Hashem, please give me the power to give us cable, even though my dad won't give it. Um, was that the first time So I didn't see much MTV or any of that. She was the host of, um, yeah, I guess... Uh, alternative nation through the 90s she was so alt super alt um all right this is actually pretty funny so Theresa may is giving a keynote address to a tory to a conference so I guess it's basically the equivalent uh, in this country of more or less of like, you know, I'm addressing the, the DNC right. or the RNC, as it were. And she is <laughs> middle of her speech. And apparently there's a lot of people in the audience who are coughing, you know, doing the old <laughs> type of thing. I don't know what the, the British version is. Actually, that. that was a Theresa May herself was having coffee. Oh, she was? Okay, yeah. okay. So uh, apparently there's this comedian there, uh, a guy named Simon Brodkin. I've never heard of him, but uh, he looks pretty funny. He is handing her a form as she's giving the speech. Somehow he got up into the front and is like holding up a form, which is the equivalent in this country of a pink slip. But this is actually a tax form. <laughs> Uh, that you are given when you are let go, uh, I guess presumably so that you can, um, I don't know, shore up your, close out Apply your tax. Apply for a new benefit that I'm she's sure. going to cut or something? <laughs> so here it is. She's in the middle of her speech. And then like from the bottom of the TV screen, you could just see this form sort of like creep in, like almost like a puppet. It's pretty funny. And it's the Conservative Party that has a vision of an open, global, self-confident Britain. While our opponents flirt with a foreign policy of neutrality and prepare for a run on the ground. <laughs> Some people say we've spent too much time talking about Jeremy Corbyn's past. There you go. He's giving the thumbs up like I gave it to her. I have to say that this is the thing, though, about British people. I, I loathe Theresa May. And I'm even at the, like, I guess, like many people in my cohort i almost can even like emotionally identify with corbin taking her slot but she has a little smirk there like the, her reaction was not completely like yes she Good had one. the british like i will, just I will that. acknowledge that that is well played yes like and i i appreciate that a lot even at her she she took it and she slowly put it down and pretended like i didn't it's all right she gave him a little like all right very Not funny. Me. Fair, sort very, of funny. very funny. Very, very funny. Yeah. I also like to com uh, to compare it to when Rupert Murdoch got pied. Like this is just so much more effective because then you don't have the issue of like feeling sorry for him. Yeah, there. The, I mean, that is right. much more effective because there's th this thing is broken. This is bad news. 
Um, yeah, there is no sympathy. There is no, oh, that's in horrible taste to, to make that type of joke. She could have been very nervous that someone was handing her a piece of paper. Uh, well, if Trump got handed a pink slip, I basically that would take up his entire memoir. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, I created world peace, and that is totally unfair guy. It's probably an illegal. Totally <laughs> unfair. George and Saul, you mentioned Crosscheck. Any thoughts on Greg Pallas? He's been on Democracy Now! RT, The Real News, and Infowars. Bombastic filmmaking style and presentation. Is he legit or no? I mean, I think he's done some very good reporting. Uh, but I think there are times where he's there's a lot of hyperbole, and it's tough to determine, frankly, you know, what is, what is not and what is. And I... Um, Sometimes you really got to read in. I mean, uh, I know that Ari Berman was skeptical of his claims about some of what Crosscheck. I mean, clearly there is an attempt by Republicans to do that. And I think he describes it uh, very well. So he's um, certainly a, a helpful source. But I think you have to be very careful in what you parse out is sort of... Um, Prose and uh, performance art. Poetry in there, I guess. Dissident, dissident peasant. Hello, Sam. Is your favorite Russian agent bizarrely progressive Southern gentleman? I just want to uh, say I really hope the Supreme Court gives us some relief on voting rights. If people feel as though the political process is dead end, they'll become alienated. Uh, and down the road, I fear what lies. Stay dissonant surfs, great team, MBS, and Moon Lake, Michigan, 2020. <laughs> and Buenara, one, two, three, four, five, six. Why did those lazy Puerto Rican truckers not bring out their magic hover trucks, which don't need fuel? The DX fool, what? Question mark? Nelly girl. Report, uh, Mark Cuban considers 2020 run. I guess he would run against Zuckerberg. Of course. He's been playing that for a while. Uh, Nick from Manitoba. Hey, Sam, great interview today. Of course, this base gerrymandering, no surprise, just reinforces what we already know. Republicans are not interested in democracy, only concerned with amassing wealth and power. Of course, they'll continue to gerrymander and rig. Uh, always, I think if there's one big takeaway, it's that Matt can crack and pack my wife in. <laughs> Stay sweet. <laughs> Lauren. Hey, guys, I went to the Birmingham rally for Doug Jones with Biden. I think Doug Jones has a good shot all over the state. There's a giant grassroots movement, even in my very conservative district. Republicans hate Roy Moore so much they see us with Jones bumper stickers and ask us to tell them about Doug because they can't vote for Roy Moore. A lot of people my age, early 20s, were at the rally telling me they decided to get involved when Roy Moore became the nominee. Jones definitely needs to reach out to the black communities more. Prosecuting KKK members is obviously not enough to earn their vote, but it's getting really frustrating seeing crappy pundits who aren't from Alabama and people who haven't talked to us saying Doug Jones has no chance because it's Alabama. We're not letting Roy Moore go to the Senate without a fight. Also, Biden took the time yesterday to take a shot at Bernie and talked about how great compromise is. I can't believe I ever liked the guy. I always love the show. Life, left is always best. You Fuck know, out of here, bad it's man interesting. for the credit card industry. Um, there is... I think there's a lot of trepidation for Democrats, national Democrats, to get involved in this race because there is an a there is a sense that you don't want Roy Moore to be able to run against the Democratic Party. You want Roy Moore to have to run against Jones and Jones to make this a referendum about Roy Moore rather than a referendum about Nancy Pelosi or Chuck Schumer. So there's it's interesting. I think the idea was that Biden's the only one they can send down there. And, um, you know, who runs against Joe Biden? Yeah, Biden's a, a fairly popular figure. And just benign. Like, what's the hook on Biden? Too white, too old man. Like, that's Roy Mars like. So they sent out their, their emblem of white privilege out here to come attack Yeah, me. exactly. <laughs> you know, the last thing I need, I think folks in Alabama need to be lectured not, by another pampered, straight, heteronormative. Not God Another pampered, but, straight, but hetero Lauren, white man. But, Lauren, look, the bottom line is 
people in Alabama, people like yourself, need to just go f- full throttle. And this is going to be if if Democrats win, it's going to they're going to steal this one. It's going to be like it's going to be a, a, like a shocker type total of total shock. I still think it's. I mean, I don't. I shouldn't say this. I think it's basically impossible. But I, I wonder if in this race is there any well, is there any impossible. race that okay yeah it's uh, unlikely but i think that's you know the point i is, guess what, is where would you put if, it i would put it more at like five percent versus twenty percent like i think it's exceedingly unlikely but what i was curious I, about i it, think there's a 15 percent chance i mean i think there's a 15 percent chance um and and that's a very slim chance but that's you know no I, what I was, donald trump had that chance yeah i mean but i think Right. Fair enough. I mean, I guess ex- exceeding. I mean, I thought Don, I guess I would think Trump would have a bit more of a chance than a Democrat here. But regardless, is there some is there somebody that could tell us whether or not there there's o- there's these voters that people will kind of mention in a place like Alabama that might have a kind of very conservative disposition. But with somebody like Roy Moore, they might feel a like sense of national embarrassment sending him to the senate but then by that same token you know trump's president now so that argument looks really different like you know hey we're embarrassed about sending this person to congress well look who runs the country don't get more embarrassing than that I, i mean it's not necessarily embarrassed i mean i don't know um i don't know what you know this is a guy who wants to outlaw being gay I don't know if embarrassment is it. There may be a lot of people who stay home because they're just like, you know, that's what you're hoping for, right? So, let's see. Alex Cap, there's a huge issue with the caller from PA's call to be a single-issue voter on gun control. Gun control uh, laws are not neutral, and just going hard on any gun control will not benefit people. I don't want Democrats doing sit-ins to make sure the people on the terror watch list can't get guns because that's not going to help the vast majority of cases. It's just going to make um, it's just going to make sure that already at risk people in the U.S., namely Muslims or people with names associated with Islam, can't get guns. And Democrats are just not able to convince me that many of their propositions are going to do the useful but hard work for gun control while not disproportionately hurting working class people, people of color, Muslims and already at risk groups. It's a it's a it's a tricky thing. No doubt. Death tongue. Matt Bevan endorses Bring Your Bible to School Day on official government-run YouTube channel. That's sweet. That's very nice. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> hmm. God. There used to be something during the Bush years. I don't know if it still exists. Like the presidential... Uh, prayer club I found rather disturbing what did that entail I, I I don't know it was an email list I couldn't remember exactly twisted tea cozy what do you think of the government that Vegas the argument that Vegas shooters white privilege helped him stockpile weapons without drawing attention of authorities I mean I don't know if it's his uh, white or wealthy privilege um, it could have been a function of how he moved around I don't know enough of the details of where he bought all these guns I mean if he bought one you know in different states or different parts of the state but I was watching a clip of of Hayes interview a gun shop owner who was like, we don't give guns to anybody. You know, the laws are the law, but we've got to be a psychiatrist. We've got to be a doctor. We've got to be a therapist. Uh, I've had people come in here. One guy came in here with uh, all beat up and he had bandages on and he said uh, he wanted a gun. And I was just like, mm, no, I don't think so, buddy. Come back when you're you're feeling, you know, when you cool off. And I'm watching this and I'm going like, uh, dude, so we got to rely on every salesman at the Dick's Sporting Goods store who <laughs> who is selling these guns to take the same level of care that you do or that you are at least telling us you do? I'm sorry. It's insane. 
Uh, Contagious Shamil. Sam, have you read the article in Jacobin about the workers in St. Louis? If not, you should read it because they provide a potential way forward post-union destruction. I will check that out. Will you look for them? Um, yeah. um, it's time to have those. We did a couple of those. I think we had Rich Yeselson on, on his union, um, what was it, bunkerism or strongholdism or uh, I can't remember. But um, we may need to do that again. Here's a here. This this is a great story. I love this story. This is a pretty funny, pretty funny. Fortress one. Unionism. Fortress Unionism. June thirteenth, two thousand thirteen. Richard Yesselson. Man, I got uh, total recall. Um, well, I got eighty-five percent recall. Sure. So there's this guy, Representative Tim Murphy. This is, this is like, I feel like this, this deserves a little bit of. Representative Tim Murphy. He got a text message in January by a woman named Shannon Edwards, a woman he had had an extramarital relationship with. Now look, Whatever. That was the sad part. <laughs> no, I don't care. Tim Murphy wants to have a uh, an affair. God bless. Up to him. Family values. Okay. Little hypocritical, but it's not like he's you know going out there and um, uh, you know advocating stoning for adulterers. If he was doing that, then maybe there'd be an issue. So. But this is what Shannon Edwards wrote to Congressman Murphy in response to an anti-abortion statement he posted on his Facebook from his congressional office's Facebook account. And she wrote, you have zero issue posting your pro-life stance all over the place when you had no issue asking me to abort our unborn child just last week when we thought that was one of the options? <laughs> and then Mr. Murphy wrote back that same day. I get what you say about my March for Life messages. I've, I've never... <laughs> I've never written them. Staff does them. I read them and winced. I told staff, don't write anymore. I will. Now, look, I've been there, man. I've been there with the crew in this place. With the mean things that they say about Dave Rubin. <laughs> and other things like that. It is tough. It is tough. It's tough to get good staff. Um, which brings me to the second part of that story. <laughs> uh, apparently this was part of like a document dump that somebody sent to the, uh, local paper. Another part of that document dump was a six page memo to Congressman Murphy, supposedly written by his chief of staff, Suzanne Mozichuk, in which the office of Congressman Murphy was described as a hostile workplace where Mr. Murphy repeatedly denigrated employees and threatened them and created a state of terror. The June 8 memo The June 8 memo was entitled Office Conduct and Behavior Harassment Slash Legal Compliance. And it says there had been ongoing and ever more pronounced pattern of sustained and appropriate behavior from the congressman. The memo <laughs> criticized his, quote, inability to hire and retain competent staff, abysmal, abysmal office morale, as well as, quote, hostile, erratic, unstable, angry, aggressive and abusive behavior. I mean, a great guy. Hostile, erratic, unstable, angry, aggressive, and abusive behavior. I feel like at this office, 
I'm allowed to get away with four of those, but not six. The office, according to the memo, has had nearly 100% staff turnover in one year. It's lost more than 100 staffers over the past 15 years. 100 staffers. And then there was this uh, little anecdote, which I also found to be pretty good. This is from uh, a visit involving Mr. Murphy that he made to his home district. Quote, you were storming around as we walked in. And as we sat down for prep, having just arrived literally moments ago, you started in on blank, the legislative director, and verbally abused him, harassed him, chastised him, and criticized all of his work products. You called many of the work products that he literally gave up his weekend to produce as useless. You pushed other documents off the table <laughs> to the floor because they weren't what you wanted. Then you got angry and demanded we find the documents you had just thrown on the ground. Now, let me take this time Hello. to defend the congressman exactly. in this Exactly. Thanks for your honesty. There is nothing more uh, frustrating than having uh, your employees force you to throw papers on the ground and then not be able to find the papers that they supposedly put there for you. So, um, is my goddamn sound sheet? Where's the sound sheet? I just threw everything, and now I don't know where everything is because I threw it. I was there telling a story about Benjamin, but now I'm upset. Look, <laughs> and um, let's face it. I mean, how can Tim Murphy be a great fucking advocate for the unborn if he has a fucking kid on the side? Time will get monopolized. Think a little strategically, Snowflake. There you go. Jesus, Samantha. I thought you wanted to kill as many white children as possible. So, Representative uh, Tim Murphy, um, both showing that he's um, a hypocrite, but also showing that, you know, this whole pro-life stuff, it just... They are just duping the suckers. So thank you, uh, Tim Murphy, for that. And speaking of duping the suckers, Mick Mulvaney was on uh, with Fox News Sunday's Chris Wallace. Now, understand there's a real problem that the Republicans are having because there is not only the real life experiment of Kansas to show that the Laffer curve is a joke. Um, there's also the problem of people like Thomas uh, Piketty's research, which shows that tax cuts do not spur growth. There's also the document that Treasury had to pull off its own website because it was a study which showed that tax cuts for corporations don't get passed on to workers nearly as much as the administration wants to pretend. So, and Mick Mulvaney has this other problem. They wanted to cut Medicaid by $1.5 trillion, and they can't now. They blew it. So, all of that talk, do you remember that... Mick Mulvaney, the co-chair of the Freedom Caucus. These guys are not going to vote for a budget. When you're in the Freedom Caucus, it's going to raise the deficit. Because if we do, China's going to sell all their bonds and we're going to be in big trouble. Right? Well, man, not so much. That is the issue, of course, because the Senate Republican budget plan calls for a tax cut. Uh, that is going to cost the Treasury one and a half trillion dollars over the next 10 years. And some outside experts say that, that the plan that was unveiled this week actually will add two trillion dollars to the debt over the next 10 years. Now, back when you were in Congress, you were a deficit hawk. What happens, sir? 
Yeah, and I think that two trillion number is coming from that same organization that did not score this dynamically, didn't look at the potential for that, economic that's growth. That's coming from a bunch right. of different growth. Uh, the, it, it does, but let's talk about it because I've been very candid about this. We need to have new deficits because of that. We need to have the growth, Chris. If we simply look at this as being deficit neutral, you're never going to get the type of tax reform and tax reductions that you need to get to sustained 3% economic growth. We really do believe that the tax code is what's holding back the American economy. The reason we've been growing at 1.8% for the last 8, 10 years, um, which is way below the historical average, is in large part because of our tax code. Yeah. There's absolutely no basis for that assessment whatsoever. Um, and he never answered the question. You got to score dynamically. <laughs> <laughs> you know, dynamic to go nowhere. Look at me, Lucky Charms. What's going on with the microphone? I don't know. I don't know what happened last night. Is that? Is that? Am I getting half of it in? No, I mean, now you're a hundred percent. Is it? Nothing happened last night. Until, oh, you know, well, just it was normal. Hmm. Hmm. There was one part where Matt said, "Hey, after the show's over, jiggle, you go break jiggle, Sam's mat, uh, well, just to fuck around." Well, I've a seen bit. you try and do anything around a microphone, and it is pretty impressive. Like, yeah, the, the, the different the things. One thing that I do better around a microphone than you is talk into it right well <laughs> that may be the case but i've also seen you try uh, and uh, 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 move uh a, a uh, boom by unscrewing the <laughs> i was playing tetherball with the mics last night. i was <laughs> surprised <laughs> all right um matt was like can we wrap this up i want to get high and play tetherball oh all now. right i got time for one more call and then um uh two more ims and then we gotta go call from a 612 area code who's this where you calling from um, good afternoon. This is Brenda from Minneapolis. Hi, Brenda. Uh, what's uh, what's on your mind? Well, a couple of things. Uh, for one, got to be quick, uh, though. Got to be quick. What what pushed me to uh, call was was um, uh, the interview with uh, Contrapoints the other night. I'm trans myself, and, and so I'm just extremely appreciative when, whenever um, you know there's some there's some reciprocity or. or, or I, I don't know how to describe it. Uh, I just really, I really admire her. I deal on the internet with um, uh, a lot of abuse every single day, so uh, I just really appreciate having a voice on there that is reflective of, of, I guess, my identity or something. I guess I don't want to play identity politics, but you know what I mean. Yes. I don't know how to. She's incredible. You know what I mean. It was, it was a pleasure to have her. Yeah. On. She's yeah. brilliant. I. I just, really look forward to her um yeah i really you know i i want to call sometimes but i don't want to be that person who's calling because i'm a member of a, a particular minority group saying uh you know you know what i mean i, I sort of yeah, want it to be I just mean, normal I, yeah I, I mean i i can i can understand that because you don't want to be right. i mean that to be the the focus of your uh, uh right. of your call but you know I, I but i also can understand at the same time it's like um you know the the you know i guess you know seeing people like who have been marginalized um you know be uh in the media without it being an issue yeah. is also really important too so i mean it's a yeah, well, it's a tough tough era to be to yeah. be to be yeah. in in that in, in in you know among other uh, well, difficulties but i have real i think and i think credible fears about this administration and the general yeah. turn that yeah. things are going in um but it you know and i also want i'm so appreciative of the voice of um, uh, Majority Report. You had the guy on before. That was very moving. I, I don't know how to respond to that. Yeah. Um, and I don't do funny accents. I don't do um, funny uh, jokes and things like that. But I want to contribute. The only way I can contribute is you were looking for somebody to interview about race, and I wanted to um, uh, nominate Falguni Chef who is a, um, who was at Emory Anivers University, and she has a book called Toward a Political Philosophy of Race, which I, I think I have 
no idea if she would be a good interviewee, but okay. um, the book is fascinating. All right, I'm going to check it out. Renda, I'm sorry, I got to go because I got to literally in a minute, in, in 90 seconds, I have to do uh, some other uh, pre record interviews. But thank you. You're I doing appreciate great work. Thank Keep you. it up. All right, thank Bye. you. Bye. All right, folks, I'm sorry. We have no more time for any more calls. I'm going to take um, two IMs. Solidarity with uh, Java. Do you see the unelected monarch in Spain lecturing Catalans on proper democracy? I'm sure that'll help unify Spain. Indeed, Rachel and Justice. Two unrelated thoughts. Thank, uh, thanks, Michael, for correcting Sam on that thing the other day. Nudge, nudge. And you don't know uh, cupcakes don't love people. People do. All right, folks. See you tomorrow. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want, but I know. Pop!